This issue of Meadow Afternoon will find us turning oranges into marmalade, crafting some simple birthday cards, sewing a phone bag and taking a trip into Narnia. Bright spots of orange and yellow hide in the leaves. Gently dancing in the breeze, they bob up and down. Full of juice, some sweet and some sour, it is the season for citrus fruits. For lemons, for tangerines and for oranges. Falling from the trees in abundance, they are bright spots of colour as winter merges with early spring. There is something very grounding in the repetition of seasonal activities. Things you can come back to at roughly the same time each year. They have that beautiful rhythm found in time-honoured traditions that mark the changing seasons. One of these seasonal rhythms for my family is making the marmalade. Each year, when the oranges are in season and are laden on the trees, we purchase crates from a local orchard. Then begins the process of turning the juicy oranges into a sticky sweet treat. We try to make enough to last the year, until the next orange season begins. The process for making marmalade is simple, but time-consuming. Setting aside an entire morning is usually a good idea, if not the afternoon as well for good measure. The oranges are peeled and cut into slices. The white pith is separated and boiled to create a thick liquid. This will help set the marmalade when it's finished. The rind is sliced into thin strips. This adds a zesty bitterness back in. Every part of the orange is used in a different way. The flesh, the pith and the peel work in harmony. Nothing else is needed except for sugar and water. The sugar will preserve the marmalade through the cold winter and the hot summer. I like to break up the batch and make several smaller ones instead of one large batch, as it makes it a little easier on the hands with so much cutting and peeling to do. This small batch here is one of several that we will make to keep the cupboard stocked with marmalade. Most of the jars will be consumed, spread lavishly on hot buttered toast, while others will find their way into baked goods and some will travel out as gifts. Thank you. 
The final task after the marmalade is boiled and set into the jars is to water bath the jars. This is another step to help the marmalade last the year. Then I can add my labels, writing down the date and the contents. In the modern world, many have the ability to purchase all types of fruits all year round. However, it is usually cheaper to buy bulk fruit when they are in season and to buy as locally as possible. These yearly traditions become markers, things I look forward to as they belong only to a certain time of year. Activities that belong to a certain time of year become all the more special because you don't do them every day. Like a birthday or a holiday, even something as humble as making marmalade can carry that special connotation. Encompassed in a jar of orange, the marmalade captures the taste of citrus season, preserving the bounty to take through the rest of the year. This is the magic of marmalade. As the days are still chilly and there's some extra time to burrow away indoors, I'm spending a couple of afternoons working on another batch of useful items. Homemade greeting cards of both the thank you and the birthday varieties. There are three main greetings that I tend to stick to for my stack of pre-made cards. Thank you, happy birthday and a simple hello. This should cover most of my greeting card needs. I find it useful to have a stack of these on hand, to pop in a gift bag, to slip into a book, or to send to a friend. Once all the supplies are brought out, everything is set up, a podcast or a video is playing, and the layout of the card is finally decided on, this is, of course, the most time-consuming part of the entire process. It can often make good sense for me to make a batch of cards instead of just one.
These ones today are comprised of a watercolour background with a black pen image drawn on top. A stamped image on top of the watercolour also works lovely as well. A little bit of paint roughly swished across the page. There's no need to fuss as splatters make it look all the better. Then a few lines are drawn in black ink, gentle flowers and curling leaves. An orange of course and a lemon or two. Simple objects to send to her and him. Added next are the words Written or stamped, either way will do. To finish at the end, buttons can be placed and maybe even a floating butterfly could be convinced to land perfectly in one corner. At the end of a day's work, a stack of cards can be put away, ready and waiting for when they are needed. Once there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. So begins The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Peter, Susan Edmund and Lucy would soon be swept into the world of Narnia and off on a great adventure. First published in 1950, The Chronicles of Narnia have become beloved children's classics, with various film and TV adaptions made over the years. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe was the first Narnia book written and published However, chronologically speaking, it is the second book in the Narnia series, with the magician's nephew sitting before the events of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. The story is about four siblings who enter the magical world of Narnia, a place caught in the grip of the evil White Witch, her power holding Narnia forever under the spell of winter, an endless winter where it snows, but it is never Christmas. The children, along with a cast of new friends and the wise and mighty lion, Aslan, set out to defeat the witch and return peace to Narnia. It is a lovely story with a well-constructed plot and thoughtful characters, charming and whimsical, but not overly saturated or cotton candy sweet. As for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been to Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. I'm going to give a spoiler alert for this next section if you haven't read the book. My favourite part of the story is Edmund's character arc and his journey from betrayal to forgiveness. The second youngest of the group of children, Edmund is entranced by the White Witch's Turkish delight and he ends up betraying his siblings joining for a time the side of the enemy. A family betrayal is something that's hard to forgive, but Edmund's arc is written very thoughtfully and I think realistically for a little boy who fell under the witch's spell and became annoyed with his older brother who was cross with him 
and then finds himself aligning with bad people. Edmund does quickly become frightened when he sees how evil the witch is and soon regrets his decisions. It's a very heartening moment when Edmund is rescued and brought back to the others. It's also a moment that looks forwards and not backwards in blame. Here is your brother, Aslan says. There is no need to talk to him about what is past. There is also a thoughtful moment where the older brother Peter acknowledges how his own behaviour may have impacted Edmund. He says, This was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him and I think that that helped him to go wrong. Edmund's betrayal and rescue is a crucial part of the story and one that I think is well written and presents Edmund's character arc in a very hopeful way. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter shall meet its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. C.S. Lewis embedded the Chronicles of Narnia with Christian biblical symbolism, parallels and elements of the stories can be seen as allegorical. I won't go into too much detail here as there are many others who have studied this topic and can elaborate much better, but I wanted to mention this aspect of the book. The book blends these elements in a way that is unintrusive for readers. The book places story first and then weaves in the biblical parallel seamlessly so that everyone can enjoy the story. Indeed, you can read the book without knowing they exist within the pages. The story is ultimately universal. It's one where good triumphs over evil. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. But don't go trying to use the same route twice. Indeed, don't try to get there at all. It'll happen when you're not looking for it. There was a jug of creamy milk, Mr Beaver stuck to beer, and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table, from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish if you eat it when it has been alive half an hour ago and has come out of the pan half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish, Mrs Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and gloriously sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot and at the same time moved the kettle onto the fire so that when they had finished the marmalade roll, the tea was made and ready to be poured out. Page 82 Inspired by this cosy scene from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, I went into the kitchen to bake my own great and hopefully gloriously sticky marmalade roll. Given that the book was set during the Second World War, when food rationing was in full effect in Britain, it's easy to see how excited the children would have felt falling into Narnia 
and getting to eat these treats once more. Edmund has his unfortunate run-in with the Turkish delight, and Mrs Beaver serves the other's marmalade roll. After consulting wiser family members, I was advised to make a suet-based pudding as it would be more in keeping to the time period of the book rather than a cinnamon-style roll recipe. Taking that advice, I did just that. Suet, flour, sugar, milk, baking powder and a pinch of salt. Everything measured, mixed, kneaded and finally rolled out on a flour-dusted surface. Then comes the sticky marmalade. Generously heaped and spread over the dough, I couldn't help pausing a couple of times to admire the beautiful colour. After baking and steaming away in the oven, it came out hot and indeed pretty sticky. I added in a few elements of my own to the roll. Some flaked almonds on top, a little custard to serve and topped finally with a few tinned mandarin slices. A simple yet yummy tea time treat for today and a very marmalady one at that. Let's head over to the sewing machine. I have a little bag to make, something I've been needing for a while. In keeping with the marmalade theme today, I found this lovely fabric from Rifle Paper Company and their Bramble collection. Scattered with flowers, leaves and citrus fruit, it was a beautiful design. For this project, I paired it with a beige gingham. I decided to make myself a little phone bag. When going for a walk, or working in the garden, or popping down to the local shop, I often just want to take my phone. I don't need to take a larger handbag or a backpack if I'm just going for a quick walk. I needed a little bag for my phone, one with a pocket for the phone itself, and then a spare front pocket with enough room for a pen and a mini notebook or you could use the extra pocket for a credit card or a coin purse. Something that was light and simple to grab as I headed out. 
To add structure to the bag, I used a rustic burlap fabric. I used this in the place of a regular stabiliser, as it's much easier for me to get. I'm also adding in a little bit of burlap ribbon as well, a little extra detail to the front and the inside pocket. I enjoy making myself and others functional objects, and I love bags and pouches. They're very satisfying to make and they don't tend to use up too much fabric. It may be easier to buy a bag like this from a store, but I like being able to choose my own fabrics and trimmings, and I enjoy the satisfaction found in making things myself. There's something calming about sitting at the sewing machine, feeding the fabric through and listening to the hum of the needle going in and out. It's relaxing and productive at the same time, provided of course that the sewing machine is working correctly and not causing you a headache. I'm currently working on items for my online shop and I hope to have soon a PDF pattern of this bag available as well as physical products, printed stories, bags and more. I'll share more about this next time. If you are watching this video a while after the release, I will come back and update the links in the description box when the products are available. From Below, a short story by Ida Williams. I paused for a moment and set down my load. The sun was beating down and a large cramp creeping on with each step that I took. I shook out all of my legs one at a time, the stiffness quickly draining away. It felt good. Picking up the plant again, I began dragging backwards, treading carefully across the rocky ground. The others hurried about me, 
some with larger loads, and others, I was pleased to see, with far inferior collections. A friend soon walked beside me, pulling a sizeable seed. Hi Rebecca, she was always cheerful. I greeted her in return and complimented on her find. Oh, this, she twitched. Not bad, Martha has one much better. Mine is a little crushed on the end. It won't matter much anyway, I replied. Grub is grub. I suppose so, she hopped lightly over a large boulder. I did want to earn a prize today. I might have better luck on the night shift. I found myself suddenly in a ditch. Not an impossible problem, but one I had to focus on to pull my cargo across safely, and so her comment went unanswered. I too had thought of the treat, that small drop of orange stickiness out of the great glass jar. If you were lucky, your drop contained a large slice of orange rind as well. But it was useless. I had not once come anywhere near the top of the day's takings. I was too slow and too clumsy. We moved on, following the trail through the grasses. My attention wandered from the task at hand and headed out around me. The grasses were tall and slender, moving backwards and forwards in the breeze, like a chorus of elegant dancers. Their rhythm was gentle and their synchronisation perfect. What was the tune they danced to? Perhaps the sound of the wind whistling or the dry seed pods rattling. This was probably why I never did win the coveted drop of orange marmalade. It wasn't much of a mystery, really. As we rounded a fallen leaf, we heard a rumbling and then a loud voice called out behind us. Come on, double time. Call yourselves workers at that speed. We instinctively moved quicker as the owner of the voice sped past us chastising us even more as she went. Her larger legs and bulky size made easy work of the distance as she powered through in a blur. What do you say? Her voice boomed and rippled with practised precision. Yes sir, sorry sir, we responded. As quick as she appeared, she was gone, leaving dust and rocks sliding over the ground in her wake. My friend and I glanced sidewards at each other and repeated her words in deep, mournful voices. It was our small rebellious strike, our spot of mockery in the turned face of authority. The crowd around me thickened as our destination loomed up before us. My friend pushed on with a sudden burst of extra speed, keen to finish. She was soon up the side of the hill and hurrying down inside. I found myself slowing down once more and looking up at the sky above. A tree branch of deep green leaves sat themselves against the floating clouds. A bird landed amongst the foliage and sat for a moment. He looked down at us swarming on the ground below. I looked up at him and his feathers. What did it feel like to have feathers? Could he feel each one? Did they tickle when he stretched his wings? I started up the sides of the mound, tugging and pulling my consignment. I was slow and easily distracted. I would not win any prizes. Still, I felt that in my moments of wandering, I saw things that the other ants could not. Pretty things. The end.
Thank you for watching today's episode. If you're new, welcome, my name is Ida. These are inspirational style videos with seasonal slow living, short stories, creative projects, history, cooking and updates for my novels. Think of these videos as visual magazines coming into your subscription feeds every few weeks. Feel free to say hello in the comments below and please consider subscribing so you don't miss the next issue of Meadow Afternoon. Until next time.